Would you stand with me, please, as we read together from Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 27. Then came to him some, Pharise- some Sadducees, those who denied that there is a resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife with no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring to his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second, and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. So in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to him, to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live in him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this true and inerrant word. Would you, by your Holy Spirit, hide the messenger this morning and make the word so clear. Compel us not just to know it, but to live it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A young uh, man named Mark was returning from a camping trip. And uh, when he got in the house, his parents said, how'd it go? And he said, well, the scoutmaster told me I can't, I can't go on any more trips. And his dad said, you, you can't go on any more trips? What did you do? He said, well, I, I, I lost the compass when I was going across the stream. I dropped it, and, and we couldn't find it. And his dad said, you, you mean just for the sake of one little compass? They're not letting you come back? And, and Mark said, well, it wasn't just the compass that got lost. We all got lost. Because when you lose your compass, you lose yourself, right? That's what happens. You have to have your compass. And see, the problem with the Pharisees was that they, uh, the Sadducees was that they had lost their compass. They claimed allegiance to the Bible, to the Old Testament that they had, the first five books only. But they claimed allegiance to that. But the truth was, what was the ultimate in terms of their authority was their own human reason. That was their true compass. It was a bad choice. It was a bad choice. It's always a bad choice. It caused them, in their case, to miss their Messiah who was standing right in front of them. In fact, it caused them to determine to kill him. But before they did that, they had to discredit him. So here they stand, the last of the group of people that keep coming at Jesus during this last week of his life. The Sadducees, the elite of the society. The brightest of the brightest, the richest of the rich, the most educated of the educated. Here they are. And they bring their question, as others have brought theirs. And their question, because they do not believe in the resurrection, is to pose this issue where a woman has seven husbands as a result of believing and following part of the first five books of the Bible. Book of Deuteronomy. To them, that's fine to have this going on in this life. It makes sense, because as one husband dies, she needs another one. But in the resur- if there is such a thing as a resurrection in the afterlife, what a mess. Now you got one woman and seven husbands. They're poking fun at the very idea of an afterlife based on this question. So Jesus responds. 
And Jesus' response is really twofold as we see the, the, the broader response from the book of Matthew. Because he says in Matthew 22, verse 29, he looks at these guys. Now remember, this is, this is the priestly caste. He's this, he's this itinerant carpenter from Palace, from Galilee. But he looks at this elite group and he says, you are wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Why are you wrong? You're wrong because you do not understand either the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't understand the two most basic things in life. You've lost your compass. I think it's interesting that Jesus is not beating around the bush here, is he? If you read Matthew 23, you'll find out that earlier, uh, just prior to this incident, he had talked to the Pharisees in some pretty harsh terms. I'm sure he did it in a loving manner, but he keeps telling them over and over and over again, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. And here's why. It's too late to be beating around the bush at this point. He's going to be dying in another day. And so he says to these Sadducees, you guys have have erred in the two most basic ways that you could possibly err. You don't know God's might, and you don't know God's message. Now, last week we saw that they didn't know God's power because they didn't understand God's power to save. They were not saved. They thought they could save themselves. They could not. They didn't understand God's power to raise. They didn't believe in the resurrection Never seen one, so how could there possibly be one? Only even though there had been one in their backyard just a couple days ago in Lazarus' house. They chose to disbelieve. And they did not believe in God's power to change, to take things that are here on this earth and make them different in the life to come. They did not understand God's might. But now today we want to look at the fact that they didn't know God's message. You see, the message and the power of God go together, right? The reason they didn't understand the message of God, is uh, the power of God, is because they didn't believe the Word of God. If you don't believe the Word of God, beloved, you are lost. This is the divine authority that God has given us to live by. It's the, it has within it the power to give eternal life. It has the power to teach us how to live after we have come to faith in Christ. The Word of God is central to everything. Now, these people thought that they knew the Word. But human reason was their real Bible. They didn't know the Word, and therefore they were practicing naturalists. Naturalism is a worldview that, was, that does not take God into account. And that defines the Sadducees right down to the gnat's eyelash. That's who they were. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in resurrection. All of these things that are critical to the Bible, they didn't believe in. There are so many who are like this. You know, atheists are obvious, right? They, are, they have a naturalistic worldview. Clearly would because they don't believe in God at all. But, but of the remaining 90 plus percent of people, most of us are practicing naturalists. We are people who wouldn't matter whether God exists or not because we live as though he didn't matter. Practicing, practicing naturalists. But in the end, I hope you'll see that naturalism destroys everything. It's a dead-end street. God is not only existing, but God is active. God doesn't do it the way we would. He doesn't do it in the timing we would, but he is always active, and we must understand that or we will miss eternity. Naturalists have lost their way because they have lost their compass. Human reason is their guide. That is the ultimate to them. But reason is flawed. Human reason does not know true north. Human reason can know a lot of things, beloved. Human reason can explain an atomic bomb. Human reason can explain how your TV works. It may even be able to explain how your clicker works. You know, for me, I'm looking for somebody who can explain how my phone works. But you understand the issue. Human reason can take us a long ways. But it is not the ultimate. It does not know true north. It's been broken. 
It was broken at the fall, and it is not corrected until Jesus comes in. Human reason cannot take you home. It doesn't matter whether you're a first century Sadducee or a 21st century humanist. The result is the same. It ignores God's revelation. And that is where we get our moral compass. That is where true north is found. Without it, we are more lost than we can ever imagine. And so as Jesus answers this diabolical question that these guys bring, he goes to Scripture. He goes to the Word. He goes to the message of God because that's where true truth is found. And along the way, he's going to show us that it is flawless, it is foundational, and it is final. The word is flawless, it's foundational, and it's final. It's the one thing in this life that you can depend on. So let's look at those and see how Jesus illustrates each one here. First of all, the word of God, the message of God is flawless. Late in his own career, a couple of years before he was executed, Paul wrote a letter to a young man named Timothy. Timothy was pastoring in Ephesus at the time, and he was facing various difficulties that Paul addressed in the letter that he wrote to him. And one of the things he told him was this, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, well, verse, go back to verse 15 or so, and he tells him, remember the things that you learned at your mother's knee and at your grandmother's knee. And then he says, here's why you need to remember those. Here's why they're, they're, they're so important. He says, Remember that all Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed, breathed out by God. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, for instruction in righteousness. That's a very high view of Scripture, wouldn't you say? A very high view of Scripture. All Scripture is breathed out. Paul didn't say it's inspired. Now, I know your Bible may say all Scripture is inspired. The old King James said it that way. But inspired would, would give you the picture of something that, that somebody creates and then somebody comes along and inspires it, breathes into it. That's not the picture. The picture that Paul gives us to Timothy that he says to Timothy is this. The Scripture is God-breathed. It comes out from God. It is originating in God. It's not originating in man. It is a divine product. It is absolutely flawless. Peter gives us an indication of how it is accomplished in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says this, he says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along or borne along by the Holy Spirit. Now we know that that process that Peter defines there took various forms. Some men actually had dictation from God. A lot of people accuse us of believing that the Bible was all dictated. We don't believe that. But there were places where it was. Many of the Old Testament prophets said what? They just walked in and said, this is the word of the Lord. In other words, they had a word direct from God that they eventually wrote down, and we have it in our Old Testament. But more often, the Bible, pieces of the Bible, resulted from men writing down of their own initiative things that they believed that they had heard, that they had been taught from God, and it was the Holy Spirit who moved them to do that. It was the Holy Spirit who under, undergirded that whole project to make sure that the final product and what was actually got written and got put down into writing was exactly what God wanted, even though it had the characteristics of the personality of the person who wrote it and so on. This was the process by which the Bible came to us. The Bible clearly is implying and claiming for itself inerrancy, infallibility, perfection. It is the Word of God. Now, I realize that a lot of people nitpick the Bible these days. We get many, you know, this, hey, it contradicts itself here. We got... One angel at the tomb in Luke. We got two in Matthew. See, the Bible contradicts itself. Beloved, all of those contradictions have answers. Of course, there were two angels there. Luke just mentions one because all the way through the book of Luke, he mentions one blind man. He mentions one 
uh, that was that was in the Gadarenes that had the uh, uh, that, that, that had the uh, that was demon possessed. It's just the way he wrote. Matthew gives a fuller picture. That's common. But these are not contradictions. They're just complementary depictions of the same event. We find that over and over in the Bible. There is no proven discrepancy in the Bible despite thousands of years of effort to find one. That's the bottom line. The Bible is the perfect, flawless Word of God. Jesus saw it as flawless. If you believe in Jesus, you have to take a divine, flawless Bible with you. And he uses the word here to demolish the Sadducees. It's the word he goes to. It's the word he appeals to. Now notice in verse 37 how he does that. He says, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. Let's stop there for a moment and ask, well, why is he, why is he mentioning Moses? Why does he bring up Moses specifically? And the reason is pretty simple. It's because the Torah that the Sadducees accepted as true scripture the first five, is the first five books of the Bible. Torah, the Hebrew word for law. First five books of the Bible. They were written by Moses. So Jesus is referring here to their scripture. He's going to Moses. He accepts they accept the first five books of the Bible as authoritative. They accept Moses as the author. And so Jesus is saying, yeah, let's go there. They didn't want to go to the rest of the Old Testament. Because why? Because the resurrection is found there. That's not all over the Old Testament like it is in the New Testament, but the resurrection is there in Psalm 16. The resurrection is there in Daniel 2, where Daniel, Daniel 12, where Daniel says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Sadducees couldn't have that as scripture because it would defy their naturalistic position, right? So they did not believe in that. But they accepted the Torah because in their study of Moses in the Torah, they found no mention of resurrection. So they were good with that. So Jesus says, yeah, let's talk about Moses. <laughs> and then he rocks their world with his next statement, right? Rocks their world. Absolutely turns them inside out. Look at it. Verse 37. But that the dead are raised, which you Pharisees, Sadducees deny, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush. That's a quaint little way of saying that, isn't it? In the passage about the bush. Why did he say that? Well, because they didn't have chapter and verse divisions in those days, right? It wasn't like he could say, hey, guys, turn to Exodus 3. They didn't have that. So he says, let's talk about the passage that Moses wrote about the bush. You remember about the bush. And then he unloads this bombshell. He says, and even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where, the, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live in him. What's his point? His point is this, if you guys would just go back and read that passage about the bush, here's what you would find. You would find God saying, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jesus is saying, go back and look carefully. It's been there, hidden in plain sight, all this time, and you guys missed it. How could God say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if they weren't still alive? He would have logically said, I was. I used to be when they were alive. I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he says, I am the God of Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham. Why? Because they were still alive? Because they were alive in heaven, awaiting a day of resurrection? They were still there, hidden in plain sight as the evidence that the Sadducees could have had that their own scripture that they accepted taught the resurrection that they denied. You talk about a showstopper. That was it, right? Sadducees are dead in the water. Nowhere to go, proven wrong by their own scripture. And Jesus, you know, look at this. Jesus turned his whole argument on the tense of a verb, right? 
tense of a verb. If it's past tense, there's no argument. Because it's present tense, there's an argument that the resurrection is there. You want to tell me Jesus didn't believe in a flawless scripture? Jesus believed in the divine layout of scripture. He knew that scripture has no mistakes, even at the tense of the verb level, let alone at the word level. Jesus believed in, 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 in inerrancy. Matthew 5, verse 18, Jesus said this, For I truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Iota is the Greek word for the smallest Hebrew letter, the yod, which is like a little apostrophe. The dot is like a little part of a Hebrew verb, like a dot on top of an I in English. What Jesus is saying, not only the letters, but the individual parts of the letters have been given by God. This scripture is flawless. This scripture is dependable. This scripture is a rock. This is the scripture I count on. Jesus says in John 10, 35, scripture cannot be broken. If it says it, it means it. You must believe it. You can't undo Scripture, beloved. It's truth with a capital T. This is why, this is why in case you wonder, why we put so much, so much emphasis on Scripture in our, in our church, because we believe this. And we believe that God didn't just give us Scripture flawlessly for no purpose. He gave it to us so that we could have something to live by. It is truth to commit to. It is truth to live by. It is truth to stake your life on. I love how John MacArthur, you know, the pastor out at the church in California, Jesse and, and uh, Jason and I had the wonderful privilege to be out there this week at a conference at his church. John MacArthur used to go on the Larry King show a lot. Um, what was he on? CNN. I don't think he was network, right? But it was CNN, I think. Used to see him at Dodger games all the time. He'd be walking around there, Larry King. Larry King used to have MacArthur on because he, you know, whenever he, needed a, whenever he needed a religious expert, he would call MacArthur because he knew John would come down. Somebody asked him once, they said, how do you prepare for that? Do you get advanced questions? You know, you know, you know what you're going to run into. Do you get advanced questions? He said, here's what MacArthur, he said, he said, no, they don't do any advanced interview. I just show up. I don't know who else is going to be there. It might be a rabbi, a priest, or a confused evangelical. I don't know who's going to be. So how do you prepare? He said, it's very easy. I just want to say two things. I want to say that the Bible is the only source of divine truth and Jesus is the only Savior. I don't care what the questions are. Those are going to be the answers. I have said to Larry so many times, I don't know about that, but I do know that Jesus is the only Savior and the Bible is the only source of truth. He said off camera, Larry said to me, I wish I believed what you believe. I always say to him, it's not private. It doesn't belong to me. It's for anybody. The authority of Scripture, because it is true, because it is flawless, because it is the divine word of God, is available to anyone. It is, however, beloved, we must believe this to the bottom of the core of our being. It is the word of God. Flawless. Secondly, the Word of God is foundational, foundational, foundational. We tell the young people, because it's true, everybody eventually will build their life on some authority. And there really are only, at the end of the day, there's only two choices. Everybody sitting here today has built their life on some authority. There's some bottom line that you believe above all else. And it's either some form of human reason could be a religion, could be some scientific deal, could be some kind of philosoph philosophical deal, but it's human reason. Man made it up. It's either some form of human reason or it's divine revelation. The Word of God. It's one of those two. Everybody, all of us, we have all based our life and staked our eternal destiny on one of those two things. Human reason or the Bible. What's interesting to me is Jesus, who is God in the flesh, 
constantly referred to the Bible as his authority, not to his person. I'm not saying he never referred to his person as authoritative. He did. But his primary method of addressing any issue was to go to Scripture. He didn't jump up and down and say, hey, I'm the Son of God. Here's what I want to tell you. He could have done that here. He could have said, you guys are wrong. I personally come from heaven. I know Abraham. I know Isaac. I know Jacob. Personally, I've seen them all. They're all there. I can tell you that they're still alive. He could have done that. But he didn't do that. Instead, he went to this obscure passage of Scripture. Because it was a place where these guys also believed. And he showed them the resurrection was there from Scripture. Because to Jesus, the Word was foundational. It was, the Word is foundational. Everything comes from the Word. He does this time after time. In Luke 2, when he's age 12, first time we see Jesus outside of his birth, right? His parents have lost him when they went down to Jerusalem for the Passover. It says in Luke 2, verse 46, After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all that heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Why? Because he knew the Bible as good as they did at the age of 12. That's incredible. But that's how foundational it was. And believe me, beloved, it's not because he just knew the Bible. The same context tells us that Jesus grew in favor with God and man, and he grew intellectually, and he grew socially. That means that he got smarter. That means he didn't come out of the womb knowing the Bible. He learned it the same way we do. He learned it the same way we do, or don't. And it was foundational to his whole life, so much so that by the age of 12, he could hold his own with the greatest in Israel. It's amazing. Remember the day he joined the two disciples on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection? And they, you know, were all downcast, dejectedly heading home. They'd heard about the resurrection, but they didn't believe it. So what did Jesus do? Say, guys, wait a minute. Look, look, hang on, stop. Just stop. Just take a look at me. Don't you see it's me? Isn't that what you would have done? That's what I would have done. What did Jesus do? He opened the Bible. It tells us in Luke 24, beginning in, in verse 27, it says, And beginning in Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted in them, uh, to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The scriptures were absolutely foundational to the Son of God. That's amazing. And if he needed that kind of immersion in the, in the Word to survive, how can we think we don't? Why is it we think we can get along without it? Listen, I can tell you, you know, it, to the extent that we don't know the word or to the extent that we know it but we choose not to obey it, to the extent we give it our own misinterpretation instead of interpreting the way God has, has given us in his word, to the extent we're doing that, we're going to have trouble. You got problems in your life, I can tell you why. It's simple. You're not obeying the word of God. And we're all there. I'm not putting you in a different category than I put me. When I have trouble in my life, I'm not obeying. I'm not trusting the God that I find there. We cause our own problems. I have, I have, I, I don't think I've ever been in a counseling situation. You know, counseling, counseling in one way is simple. People come to counseling to get you to tell them that what they're thinking is okay. That's why they come. And when you don't agree with them, they tend to go away offended. But the truth is, they're having problems because they're in disobedience somewhere in the Word of God. We rationalize, beloved. God's commands, they're good for everybody else, but in my situation is unique. There are no unique situations. We're all human. We all need the Word of God, and we cannot just pick and choose. This is what I want, and this is what I don't want. That was the problem with the guys on the road to Emmaus. They believed all the parts about the coming Messiah who was going to rule the world. They didn't believe the parts about the coming Messiah who was going to die and be raised again. And yet it was all there. Can't pick and choose the Word of God. The Word is foundational. Ken Mansfield was, there um, might be a few of you who remember him, he was, he was the U.S. manager for the, uh, 
for a, for a little group called the Beatles. Uh, he wrote a book in the year 2000 called The Beatles, The Bible, and Bodega Bay. I've forgotten what the Bodega Bay part of that was, but The Beatles, The Bible, <clears throat> and Bodega Bay. And he tells about some of the raucously good times, you know, in the early days of the Beatles. And there were many, but then the Beatles broke up and the good times stopped. And by the mid-1980s, Ken Mansfield was on very hard times, heavily in debt, no money, no prospects. Essentially, his meal ticket was no longer existing. And but God was after him. He met a young lady named Connie. Now, I do not recommend evangelism by dating. In fact, I recommend against evangelism by dating. But in this case, it worked out doesn't usually. He and Connie got together. They got married. She was a devout Christian. She led him eventually to the Lord. He says this before Jesus. He said, Billboard magazine was my Bible. Record charts was my God. Prestige was my purpose. But that all went away. And then he said everything changed when Christ came in. And then he said this. He said, I needed a chart, a journal with clear direction, a log to refer to, a guidebook wherein their commandments could speak to my wandering spirit. I needed a book so powerful that its very words could burn a living message into the absolute heart of my heart. I needed the irrefutable, holy word of God the Father Almighty, the creator of the very seas I was lost upon. He needed a compass, and he found it in the Word of God. And I'm happy to report Ken Mansfield is not one of those celebrities who, you know, kind of came to Christ in a hard time, and Christ got him over the hard time, and then, you know, you forgot all about Christ. He's been very active in, in a speaking ministry and a writing ministry to the glory of God to this day. But he met God through the book. Beloved, if this is not your foundation, you're building on sandy soil. It doesn't matter whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. As an unbeliever, obviously, it's going to take you to eternal punishment away from God. But even as a believer, the difficulties in our life are almost always attributable to the fact that we're not believing and obeying the Word of God. It is foundational. It doesn't mean you won't have any troubles. But it means you'll know how to handle them. It means you know how to have peace in the middle of this because you'll know the God that is behind the Bible. It's foundational. So the Bible is flawless. It's foundational. Thirdly, it is final. The Bible is final. Look at verse 39 of our passage. It says, then some of the scribes answered, teacher, you have spoken well. Remember the scribes, right, are Pharisees. Remember that? Scribes are Pharisees. They and the Sadducees don't get along. They're totally different philosophically and uh, theologically and politically. They're enemies, except in one thing, they all unite against Christ. But the scribes then, having heard what the Sadducees have done and have, how Jesus has Taken the Sadducees down, just like he'd been taking the Pharisees down all along, they said, oh, teacher, you have spoken well. They love seeing the Sadducees get theirs, right? This was a happy day for them. So naturally, they would say that. But then the next verse, verse 40, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. This is a great final statement, because this is the last time in the book of Luke that we're going to find anybody bringing a verbal challenge to Jesus. They've been doing it all along throughout the book, right? It's the last time. And the last statement that Luke makes, and I think he makes it on purpose, they dared no longer to ask him any question. Jesus has left all of his enemies bloodied and bruised beside the wayside, buried in the dust of truth. He's done that in the hope that they will come to faith in him. He hasn't done that just for the pleasure of burying them. 
He's done that because he loves them and because he knows they need to know the truth. But the point is the truth has left everybody behind. Jesus' word is the last word. God's word is the final word. God's word is truth, and truth will always prevail. We sang it this morning. Ultimate truth is found in only one place. It's the word of God. Our relativistic society is going to be surprised one day to find out that it really is true that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no relativists and no maybe about any of that. Truth will prevail in the end. God's revelation in his written word and his revelation in the living word of his son is his final statement. And at the end of the day, you either believe it or you don't. Jesus makes the amazing statement in Matthew 24, verse 35. That it's, it's lost, I think it's lost its, uh, it's lost its impact through familiarity. But here's what he said. He said, heaven and earth will pass away. That's probably nothing any politician would say today, right? It's not a very politically correct thing to say. The very place you live is going to pass away. But Jesus said it. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. It is temporal. But then what did he say? But my words will not pass away. That is a powerful statement of the finality of the word of God. Look around you this morning. The day is coming when in eternity only two things are going to survive. The word of God that you're hearing this morning and you, the inner you, whoever you are, and of course, everybody who is here. But that's it. Everything else will be gone. This building will be gone. This town will be gone. It'll all be gone. The only thing that's going to survive in eternity is the word of God and us. It has the final word probably ought to pay attention, right? Probably should be thinking about what does it mean? Lose your compass and you'll lose yourself. Jeremiah said in 29, 23, verse 29, he said, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, like the hammer which shatters a rock? If you don't do anything else in your life, wouldn't you, don't, wouldn't you think it'd be wise to understand what this word is saying? And put it into practice in your life. David said in Psalm 119, verse 127, Therefore I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Can you say that? Does the perfection of the word of God strike you and compel you and pull you? I love how Simone Wheels, she was you know, a French writer, but she said this, To always be relevant, you must say things which are eternal. Do you ever wonder why trends happen? Because nobody is speaking eternal things except the Word of God. You won't find those in those who mock the Bible. Their books are all replaced within a generation. You won't find ultimate truth in philosophy books, nor in the psychology books. You can't find ultimate truth in, in anywhere in the world except in the Word of God. After all has been said and done, only the Word of God will survive. We don't want to make the mistake that the Sadducees made. They underestimated both God's might and his message. Came across an old poem. It's an old poem. But it makes the point. It says, Last eve I passed beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the evening chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all those hammers so? Just one, he answered with twinkling eye. The anvil wears the hammers out, you know. 
And so I thought the anvil of God's word for ages skeptic blows have beat upon. Yet though the noise of infidels was heard, the anvil is unworn, the hammer's gone. The philosophies are going to go away, beloved. The ways that we accommodate and the ways that we compromise on the message of the Word of God are going to be swept away. The scientific theories that are in violation of the Word of God are going to be shown to be false. The only thing left standing is the Word of God. The Word of God is final because it's the Word of God. Doesn't that make sense? It's the Word of God. 1 Peter 2.15, Peter says, But the word of the Lord remains forever. It's the only compass you'll ever need, but it is the only compass that can take you home. But if you leave it on the shelf, unused, unappreciated, unwanted, unneeded, it cannot do anything for you. It just as well be lost. At one point in Jesus' ministry, the crowds were beginning to go away. John 6. He just fed 5,000 of them. They came back the next day. They wanted more. He said, I know all you want is just food. I'm not going to do that. You want to make me king, so I'll feed you. I'm not going to do that. And they started to dissipate. So he turned to his disciples and said, what are you guys going to go to? Are you leaving too? He didn't beg anybody to stay. Notice that. He said, are you going too? Peter said, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Do you love his word? Does Jesus have the last word in your life? You know, the word of God, here's how powerful it is. It will either save you or it will condemn you. That's the bottom line. Jesus said this in John 12, 28. He said, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words as a judge, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. It's the one thing that lasts forever. It's the one thing that will, at the end of everything, will either save you or will condemn you. Where are you with regard to the Word of God? Listen, let the Word of God be your compass. Don't lose your compass. Don't lose your way. Use your compass. Use it every day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Word. Lord, it's so easy to preach this and to stand up here and, and everybody looks and says, wow, that guy, he, what a great guy that guy must be. And you and I both know every day I violate your word. That causes me to despair at times, Father. I hate that that happens. I thank you for putting the spirit of repentance within me. But I pray that you will point out those places where I accommodate, where I spin it my way, where I rationalize my behavior, where I point the finger at other people and sometimes either at you, even at you, instead of where it belongs, at, at myself. Forgive me. Give me a heart that seeks after you above all things. And I pray the same thing for all of us who are here today because your word is it, Lord, at the end of the day. It's flawless. It is foundational. It is final. So let us know it better than we know ourselves. Because in knowing it, we will know ourselves. And we will also know you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.